So I'm very lucky. I work in a tertiary quaternary center, which is a trauma unit. I work on the liver ICU. So this is going to be very liver focused because I love the liver. And the great thing about the liver is it regenerates. It has fantastic healing capacity. So first of all, let's just remind ourselves about the liver because what's fascinating about its anatomy is the co-location of the hepatic artery and the portal vein, central vein there, and recognize that the biliary tree is running really close to these. So in any liver injury where you've got venous injury or arterial injury, you will have bile duct injury. It might not be big, but you will get biliary contamination with risk of infection and pseudoaneurysm formation, which I'll show you later. The liver is a wonderfully vascular creature, arterial inflow, and portal venous inflow, about 25% of your cardiac volume, total blood volume going through the liver, and it's any minute. It's divided into beautiful segments. You can tell I'm an enthusiast about the liver. Each segment is independent. It has its own arterial and venous supply, its own venous drainage system, and its biliary system. And the, lesion, the segments here are those which are most commonly injured. So that's where you're likely to see your injuries, sometimes more central injuries, particularly with a bicycle injury, kids falling on their tricycles or the like, or indeed crush injuries. As I've said, the liver is a really large thing and it's fixed and therefore it is prone to significant injury, both blunt and penetrating. So for us, we see a lot of road traffic accidents. We see a moderate amount of knife injury, unfortunately. I work in a fairly deprived inner city environment. We also see um, blast, not blast injuries usually, recreational injuries, horse riding crush injuries, and the like. But we also see a fair amount of injury induced by our medical colleagues, unfortunately. Doing good, but sometimes going through the wrong organ. So by virtue of liver biopsy and intercostal tubes, we cause liver injury. And in any injury, be it penetrating or blunt, one needs to think about associated injuries. Commonly duodenal or pancreas, also sometimes with penetrating injuries, other bowel injuries, and think also obviously of kidneys and spleen. What's amazing, considering the liver is so vascular, is that more patients don't exsanguinate and the liver seems to stop bleeding really quite often. And what has changed dramatically over the years is don't intervene too much. Liver surgery is now a rarity in the management of liver trauma. It is really interventional radiology and critical care that have become the mainstays of treatment. This is how liver injuries are graded. It's the sort of thing one learns for an exam. But perhaps importantly, these are the ones that we will see mainly in the intensive care unit, the grade four, the grade five lacerations. Grade six sadly rarely gets to us, even with really good paramedical and on the scene medical intervention. Though some of the IVC uh, the arterial balloons are now getting them to us. Image-wise, this is the sort of CT you'll see. This is a fairly minor grade three injury. This is a good going grade five injury. 75% of the lobe is involved and you've got um, juxtahepatic venous injuries. So this is a big going liver injury. Just for example, this is what your biopsies can do. Um, here you've got a significant subcapsular hematoma following a liver biopsy. And this liver gets really ischemic so if the capsule doesn't burst and you don't get intraperitoneal release, you actually get a really ischemic liver underneath it. Rarely also, you get arteriovenous uh, shunting following a liver biopsy. Pregnancy-related liver rupture, either as a preemptive or preeclampsia or through adenoma, can also be really tricky. And of course, most ladies postpartum or peripartum, they complain of pleuritic chest pain. What you do, you assume it's a PE, you give it heparin, and it causes good going bleeding, as happened in this case here. She spent about three weeks on the ITU being packed. This was a chest tube. 
that similarly, someone post-cardiac surgery, pleural effusion, done under ultrasound, but we still managed to go, we, the system went through the liver. I didn't personally do this one. Um, but, you know, it is amazing with a strong arm where you can get to. And of course, it always has to be taken in the context of where the patient came from or where you're practicing. The, this was central London, a gentleman of Turkish etiology. He'd been in the UK for about 10 years. There was a minor altercation. He fell onto his right side on the pavement and arrived profoundly hypotensive and in respiratory distress. And the CT images, as, as you see them there, there was vast both portal bleeding and arterial bleeding, and it was hydatid disease. So minor injuries, major insults. So what do our trauma surgeons tell us? Well, they say, if you're hemodynamically unstable, with no active bleeding, or you're unstably unstable with a penetrating injury, you are likely to need an operation. If, however, you are stable, then you go to CT and you get embolized. The more difficult ones are the unstable, stable. And the shift is definitely going more towards CT and angiography. Our CT scanners in the middle of the ED, all of our trauma calls are actually called in the CT scanner now, providing someone's not already in there. And that allows us to actually get the imaging as we're resuscitating almost. And that's really improved. Uh, our ability to do non-operative intervention. But basically, arterial bleeding, interventional radiology and embolization, venous bleeding, if it won't stop, you end up packing. This was a young lady who unfortunately crossed the road outside of our hospital. She had an altercation with a bus at fair speed. Um, here you see the CT. This is her hepatic artery bleeding out. She went forward for embolization. As you can see, control was achieved with embolic material. And she then got packing for the venous bleeding thereafter. So really, when you've got bleeding from the liver, small venous bleeding, pressure by temporary packs, diathermy, and you suture the bleeding vessels at the point of rupture. You make sure your coagulation factors are all on board. Initially, we'll use one-to-one. -one, and we try and get temperature control to normothermia. Agreed, the neurosurgeons and the liver surgeon was, will, will sometimes have an altercation on that. But we try and run about 36 degrees. This was advice given by one of the liver surgeons, who loves liver trauma, that sometimes the best idea is to go to the coffee room have a cup of tea in theatre, and leave your anaesthetist to catch up. Stop playing for a while. And so I think sometimes when, it's, when you're at the top end of the table, it's reasonable to say to your surgical colleagues, can you just stop? Let's get on top of this, please. So, venous bleeding, packing is the default procedure. Sadly still, where I practice on occasions, packing is not done appropriately. If your liver has fallen open like a book, the last thing you should do is pack into that space. You need to compress the liver to stop it bleeding. So you pack around it all four quadrants. And you must count the packs. Similarly, we regularly get transfers in. We're told there are six packs inside you. And you go in and you find eight. That's not great. Because if you leave something behind for a long time, you get infectious complications. So we're packing, trying to avoid severe compartment syndrome, intra-abdominal pressure above 23, you're starting to hit problems with venous return. But I'll show you some porcine data shortly, which clearly shows that a bit of intra-abdominal hypertension is good in terms of control of bleeding. You need to think about reperfusion syndromes. If it's been packed really hard, and then you take the packs out, you do get a reperfusion syndrome, which can be really troubling. And if you've got packs in, it's a major injury, you will have bile leaks, it is all contaminated, it will get infected. So actually antibiotics and often antifungals need to be used early and empirically. 
You choose your antifungal based on what your colonization profile is like. We can't use fluconazole anymore or the azoles. We've got almost total resistance, so we'll use amphotericin or antilofungin. But you choose it, likewise, your antimicrobials on your own unit. So what sort of vasopressors should we be using? This is some really quite nice animal data, and I think it shows the benefit of a little bit of everything, which is probably how we cook, how we practice medicine. Porcine liver injury. Vasopressors alone, significant mortality. Vasopressins and fluid, much improved mortality, although it's opaque. Fluids alone, significant mortality. Vehicle and fluids, significant mortality. So that bit of constriction and fluids is probably your optimal management. In terms of your transfer from another, patient, another center, you've got to re-trauma call them all. You can't assume anything. So go back to basics and start from scratch. You often need further imaging, and with Paxin, that can be difficult. It can occlude a lot of image. You need to assume nothing. You go back, you look at all the drains, you do your A, B, C, D, E, and you look for future planning. So you need really clear planning. I think I might have lost a slide, which is a shame, but never mind. I was going to show you a liver being packed, but I think it's disappeared. One of the things about liver injuries, if they are not embolized at the time of presentation, is the risk of pseudoaneurysms. So again, as I mentioned, you have that biliary pool around vessel damage, and what you de develop is pseudoaneurysms. If you've embolized the artery, you shouldn't get it. If you haven't, at about 10 days to two and a half weeks post-injury, if you've got someone who's developing obstructive liver function tests, or suddenly develops melina, then think of a pseudoaneurysm. And this is a, a nice example. Again, it was just a grade three liver injury, not too bad. And this blob here in someone with profuse melina was the pseudoaneurysm that was bleeding, going out through the biliary tree, into the GI tract, and causing significant blood loss. When you do the CT angio and the angiogram subsequently, you see the vessel here. This is the pseudoaneurysm. And again, one is looking for highly selective embolization. So what's the general care? The general care is that they all appear inflamed. And most of them will have a five-day course of antimicrobials and antifungals if they're grade three, four, and above. If you've got packs in situ, again, you need antibiotics and antifungals. Feed them enterally if it's tolerated. As I've said, all packs need to be accounted for. Resection is hardly ever used. I think in my too many years of practice, I have only seen one liver resection second for trauma. It nearly always regenerates. Pain control is an issue, and you must inspect the drains for amylase and for bile. The rate of biliary injury is significant. And between about 15 and 30% of significant liver injuries will also have a significant bile leak. If you've got drains in, you'll see it coming out of the drains, as you see here. But if you haven't got drains in, you won't. So anyone who then develops fever, pain, think about, is this biliary peritonitis? Stick a needle in any fluid that's around the liver and just test and see. The great thing about biliary injuries is they will resolve. They don't need resection and they don't need surgical repair. You just put a stent across the sphincter of Odi, and then the bile will drain down into the duodenum. The only time that that doesn't work is when you've got an ileus, because you've got pressure equalization. And at that point, what you need to do is to put a nasobiliary tube down. So at the time of ERCP, feed a tube up the biliary tree, out of the nose, atmospheric pressure, and you can decompress the biliary system quite nicely. I recognize time, so a bit short, I think. So the associated injuries, think about pancreatic injuries, easily missed. Check your amylase, make sure you're okay on that. 
Diaphragmatic injuries can also be missed very easily, and you need to look for them carefully. You can see here on the CT scan that there is a diaphragmatic injury. So always look for it. Be careful about it. Thromboembolic prophylaxis. The evidence now is clear that most most, if not all, of these patients should have venous thromboprophylaxis given. Six-year study, propensity matched, it is quite clear that there was no difference in terms of interventions required or otherwise, and you avoid venous thrombosis. If you really can't convince someone to use DV2 prophylaxis, you need to think early about IVC filters. Similarly, these two studies show exactly the same that there is no difference in the decision on non-operative management or requirement of more interventions for early or late heparin, nor indeed no heparin, but that group have a much higher venous thrombosis rate. So if you're not going to use venous thromboprophylaxis, you need to significantly decide that you're taking that risk. I'm going to skip that. There is also now a nice database looking at the fact of non-operative intervention and improved outcome. So this is um, a big national trauma data bank, good number of centers. They standardize nicely for designation level, hospital and critical care beds, teaching, non-teaching hospital status, and surgical support. And despite a similar incidence of blunt trauma, the low mortality centers were those that were less likely to undertake surgical intervention. So I think all of the evidence is keep your surgeons in control. Similarly, this data showing the really important change related to damage control resuscitation using low, val low volume balanced resuscitation. If you concentrate on this side here, we're really only interested in these injuries. Significant number reviewed. In the damage control resuscitation group, much less non-operative intervention compared to the pre-damage control modules. So this is how we need to be managing these patients. And that's shown really nicely in this table here, where again, survival has improved significantly as we've become more restrictive in the amount of volume that we give. Summarized also by the Swedish data most recently, again, non-operative intervention is the way to go forward, regardless of your severity score. So, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, Management has changed significantly in the time I've been practicing ITU. We've gone from very surgically based management, really now to interventional radiology and critical care. But it is a team game. It's your paramedics out in the field, your doctors in the field, bringing them into an organized center as was being described in the previous presentation, and then the multidisciplinary team. It is all of us working together that make a difference to these patients. Thank you for your attention.